by the time I was in my late twenties, I had all this experience working for big companies, two big companies in the financial services space, two big companies in the entertainment industry. And I felt like it was the right time for a variety of reasons to try something entrepreneurial. I felt like my energy was never going to be higher. My expenses were never going to be lower. And I wanted to build something that I thought could really make a difference. I wanted to create a culture. Welcome to the Bulletproof Cashflow Podcast. Let's get into the show. Hey, everyone. This is Agostino. Running your real estate syndication venture is like any business. This means you need to get to work building a great team, studying your leadership, getting your culture on point, and keeping the dialogue open with your team. And that's the only way you're going to see a positive change happen in your organization. Well, today's guest understands this. Having worked for the largest hedge fund in the world, groups like Credit Suisse and Universal Pictures, to even working on a successful presidential primary campaign, he knows something about leading teams to success. He is the CEO of Veloz Group, where he oversees ventures across a wide variety of industries, ranging from furniture to software and consulting. Through his podcast, 30 Minute Mentors, he has conducted over 300 one-on-one -on -one interviews with top CEOs, founders, athletes, celebrities, influencers, and the top brass in the military as well. He has also written extensively on leadership, management, entrepreneurship, marketing, and sales, having authored over 70 articles published in major media outlets, including Forbes and the Huntington Post. Now, with all that, I'd like to welcome Adam Mendler to the show. Adam, thanks for coming on. Christina, good to be here, buddy. Excited. Yeah, yeah so I'm excited, too. I've been looking forward to this for a while, so this is going to be great. Now, if you like what Adam has to say, you can reach out to him via his contact page at adammendler.com. If you like our content, please don't forget to leave a comment and rate the show. It helps us out tremendously when you do. Finally, if you text the word FREEDOM to 202-410-4202, get our free ebook, The Bulletproof Guide to Finding a Broker. Okay, Adam, tell us just a little bit more about how you got your start and how you got to where you are today. Sure. So I am an LA native, born and raised here in sunny Southern California. I grew up on a street called Velos Avenue. So that's where we got the name for my company, the Velos Group. Did my undergrad at USC, uh, got my MBA at UCLA. In between, I worked for a company called DE Shaw, which you mentioned. They were then the largest hedge fund in the world. While I was getting my MBA, I worked for Universal Pictures and for William Morris Endeavor. And uh, when I graduated from business school, went back into the world of finance, working for Credit Suisse. So by the time I was in my late 20s, I had all this experience working for big companies, two big companies in the financial services space, two big companies in the entertainment industry. And I felt like it was the right time for a variety of reasons to try something entrepreneurial. I felt like my energy was never going to be higher. My expenses were never going to be lower. And I wanted to build something that I thought could really make a difference. I wanted to create a culture that I thought could help other people, uplift others, and in some small way, make the world a better place. So started the Velos Group with my brother, and he left what he was doing. I left what I was doing. And the rest is history. We've started three different companies over the years. We've created an office furniture business called Beverly Hills Chairs, where the leading sellers of refurbished brand name office chairs in the country. So the Herman Miller Aeron chair, which is the number one best-selling office chair ever made, sells for about $1,400 brand new. And what we do is we sell it for about 50% off refurbished. And um, really popular, especially right now, when everyone's trying to figure out what to buy when they're working from home. So we saw that in other really popular brand name chairs. We have a cigar company called Custom Tobacco. If you go to customtobacco.com, you can create your own fully customized private label cigars, premium cigars with your own customized cigar band. You can do that all in real time very popular for gifts and for events. We have a software development company called Velo Solutions. And as you mentioned, I do a lot of writing and speaking on the topic of leadership, 
I started a podcast called 30 Minute Mentors, where I go one on one with the most successful people in the country on how they got to the top, but more importantly, on how listeners can get to the top, whether they're Fortune 500 CEOs, founders of billion dollar companies, generals, admirals, celebrities, athletes. My goal really is to try to help listeners call the best information possible to become more successful in their careers and more successful in their lives. Excellent. Excellent. And the thing is, though, I've worked in corporate as well for some period of time, and I definitely know that when it comes to leadership, it's more than just having a C in front of your name, like CEO or CFO or whatever. It really comes down to having the right mindset, uh, putting, like you said, putting together the right culture as well. And in your case, you've done three different types of businesses, but they all share that common thread, I imagine, right? I mean, when it comes to leadership and putting your teams together, I would guess, and you can maybe elaborate on this, is what what are you doing? Are, is there a common thread between these these various businesses that you have? They're all quite different. What are what, what and what are the similarities and the differences? And, and how do you select the right people for those for those groups? Yeah, uh, you, know, you pretty much answered the question with your question. So I, I love it. I love everything you said there. It really comes down to people, in my view. The most important way to build a winning organizational culture is by hiring great people. With every great person you hire, you enhance and enrich your culture. With every bad person you hire, you increase the probability of completely imploding your culture. it ultimately comes down to hiring great people. I know that sounds very simple, but your job as a leader is to surround yourself with and ultimately empower the best people possible because leadership isn't about me, it's about you. It's about finding great people and helping them become their best selves. Providing the infrastructure, providing the guidance, providing the mentorship to allow those around you to excel to the best of their abilities. So the common threads in what we've been able to do at the Velos Group with each of our businesses, ultimately, Augustino, it comes back to having great people and having a great culture. So to do that, We've been very focused on finding people who we think will be really successful in our environment. That doesn't mean that um, they necessarily have the traditional markers that other companies will apply to people where if someone went to an Ivy League school or someone had a really good SAT score or a really good grade point average or they worked for this company before. That doesn't really tell me much. What I wanna know is what is this person's mindset? What is this person's work ethic? What is this person's attitude? Is this person team oriented? Is this person a problem solver? Is this person the kind of individual who has a can-do attitude, who will figure out how to get things done Or is this the kind of person that when the going gets tough is going to get going? And it doesn't matter. And when I think about our three businesses, when I think about Beverly Hills Chairs, Custom Tobacco, Velo Solutions, it doesn't matter whether we're hiring someone to work out of our warehouse or whether we're hiring hiring someone to work on our engineering team. We're looking for the same qualities. We're looking for the same characteristics. We're looking for someone who's smart. We're looking for someone who's team oriented. We're looking for someone who is a problem solver. We're looking for someone who is fun to be around. We're looking for someone who's humble. We're looking for someone who the other people on the team will like working with. We're, we're looking for good, high quality people. And that's how you build winning teams. Makes your job as a leader a lot easier when you're leading good people. You can't build a winning organization 
without a team of winners. And you can't scale an organization, you can't scale a business without having people around you who, who are gonna really help you get there. Yeah, and, and just, just to clarify for those folks that are listening, is that these team members are not just the people that have to essentially work for you. They can also be working with you. Like in our case, I was actually having a conversation with a friend of mine just last night about this, working with, say, brokers. All right. So we rely heavily on brokers to find us deals, to feed us these big commercial deals or to sell deals as well. And there's some brokers that I speak to. Some of them are absolutely terrible. <laughs> and and part of it is is that you have to conduct the interview. The same the same the same thing applies whether it's working inside your organization or even someone you're engaging with. I would imagine that if they don't possess those those types of qualities of what you said, the go get it attitude, the teamwork attitude, they're they're diligent about their work, you're going to have a big problem on your hands down the road. They're, you're just going to waste months of your life or years, depending on how long you hang on to them. And you're not going to get that much better for it. And I think like you said too, Adam, is that it'll taint the whole organization. It, it causes a whole lot of frustration on, on your part as well when you keep one of these people around, right? Yeah. My brother and I started this business and our sister runs the day-to-day operations for custom tobacco, which is interesting because custom tobacco is actually – the only cigar company in America that sells primarily to women. So we have a lot of men who buy from us, but the majority of our customers are actually women because we sell to a lot of women who are buying cigars for gifts for men and are buying for events. So if you're, we'll just use the example of commercial real estate. If you're a commercial real estate broker, you could be a man or a woman, doesn't matter. You're trying to figure out what do I buy that can help me either in the prospecting phase or after I'm done with the prospecting phase that can help me in the relationship development phase as I'm looking toward the next deal. So you're, you're, you've, you've already closed the deal. Now you want to celebrate the closing. So it's just an example. Why do I bring this up? Working with family it, not you don't need to work with family. Ninety nine percent of people out there aren't working with family, but I think it's important to have a mindset that business is family. Business is about people. This is not about numbers. Yeah, numbers are important. Uh, I teach a class that's uh, a leadership class, that's a data science class, but at the end of the day, it's all about people and. It, to your point, Augustino, is not only about the people who are on your payroll, but it's about all the people who are connected to your organization. And anyone who we work with is family to us. Our accountant is family. Uh, unfortunately, our accountant passed away this past year. And it wasn't losing an accountant. It was more than losing an accountant. It was it was a very, very deep and is a very, very deep personal loss to me. It was losing a friend. Um, and our accountant was uh, in his 70s, but he was a friend of mine. And, you know, he was a part of our family. And that's how we feel about everyone, our digital marketing firm. You know, our digital marketer is not an employee, but he is a part of our team. He is deeply integrated into our team. And everyone who works with us is like that, whether they're on our payroll or whether they're in any shape or form connected to our business. And I think it's really important to have that perspective because at the end of the day, any business you're in, whether you're in e-commerce like we are or software development or commercial real estate, residential real estate, doesn't matter. It's all about human beings. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. And I guess the one thing though is that I know that obviously when you form these relationships over time, you know, you got to know each other, you you spend time with that person, you know their level of workmanship, you know that they're going to perform when they need to, and when the chips are down, they're they're right there to right there by your side, helping you out solving problems. 
but in those cases that you say, for instance, it's a new, relatively new engagement, and you know what, you ha- you bring on some some vendor, say it's a I don't know mortgage broker, a, a broker that uh, that handles the financing, for instance, and they totally screw the pooch, they just mess it up. Do you give people a second chance? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, and um, look, at the end of the day, everyone makes mistakes. It's I go back to a line that I learned from one of my old professors, actually. He was a business school professor of mine, but he was also the former mayor of Los Angeles, Richard Reardon. And he used to say, only a mediocre person never makes a mistake. And it's something that I've internalized. And it's advice that I hear in different iterations from all kinds of guests on my podcast Mm. and advice that I give to all kinds of audiences that I speak to. With that said, it's important to understand whether a mistake is a, a mistake because we're human beings and we screw up or whether a mistake is uh, a sign of poor performance. So to answer your question, it's a hard question to answer in a bubble. I can tell you that as a leader, when an employee of mine makes a mistake, the last thing I do is get angry. Uh, what I what I do is I tell them, we all, we're all human beings. We all make mistakes. The most important thing to do is to recognize that mistakes are inevitable. And all you can do is learn from them take the lesson, internalize it, stay positive. Don't allow the mistake you made to bring you down, but don't make the same mistake twice. Use the mistake you made as a learning experience so that it can help you become better, stronger, more productive, and more capable as a professional. So that's how I try to help develop the, the people who I lead. As far as service providers go, um, it it really comes down to how egregious the mistake was. Is this an innocuous mistake or is this something that is perhaps a sign of sloppy work, which could be a red flag and maybe it, it might be time for us to cut our losses and move on to another vendor. So I don't really want to answer that question, um, in a bubble. I think it's, important to have other variables when you're evaluating that. But I am a very big believer in um, understanding that we are all human beings and no human being is perfect. And let's, let's just be real here. We live in, we live in the world of reality. That's right. I mean, yeah, there's, there's been cases where, I've had, like, say, for instance, I've had mortgage brokers, for instance, uh, work on a deal for us, and then they they swore up and down that a, that this lender was going to perform. They they get on a phone call and talk to the sellers of a property, and they say, oh, yeah, we're going to perform, we're going to perform. A week later, they get back on the phone call and then say, we're not going to do the deal. It's like, well, guys, <laughs> you just realized it now, right? So it's kind of it's kind of like, uh, just like I said, it depends how egregious the error is. Yeah. The uh, question is, 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 that a is that a mistake or is that dishonesty? Does that mean – because, again, to me, someone making a mistake is – look, I've, I've had jobs in the past where um, – I'll give you an example. My first job out of college, I thought that my, that my job would have been much better served being done by a machine than being done by a human because – the work that I was doing was was very prone to human error. And I actually spent my first year and a half on my job automating it because, again, I thought that a robot could do, could do it a lot better than I could, and that was what I worked toward doing. So there are certain functions that are going to lead to human error. And if you screw something up, I'll give you an example, uh, a real example, um, with our office furniture company. If we screw up an order, which we have in the past, we will in the future. You're going to screw up orders. We will. 
I mean, it just happens. We're human beings. Things get screwed up. I, I don't like it. I, we want to make as few mistakes as possible. The real question becomes, what happens when you screw up? And, and why did you screw up? Did you screw up because you were lazy? Did you screw up because you were cutting corners? Did you screw up because you have bad systems in place? Did you screw up because you're disorganized? Um, or did you screw up because at the end of the day, we're human beings and no human is perfect? Um, so if, if it falls into that category, what, what do you do? You take ownership, you take responsibility, you apologize to the customer, you make things right. You make things right so that ultimately customers understand that you're not shirking from responsibility. But there's a big difference between this topic and what you just described, which is a service provider who is over-promising and under-delivering. A service, pro a service provider who is saying whatever he or she needs to say to close the deal, even if they know that they probably can't live up to that. And when that happens, that person is, is done, in my view, because there's nothing more important than being able to trust someone. You need to have confidence in the person that you're working with. You need to know that there are someone of integrity, that there are someone of trustworthiness. And there's a big difference between that and an innocuous error. Yeah, 100%. 100%. We got, we got mortgage brokers. We got, uh, uh, we got uh, other uh, actual real estate brokers who do the same thing. They will say anything just to get a deal. And those are the ones you have to watch out for. Those are absolutely the ones to watch out for. Now, a big part, Adam, of, of trying to pull in the right talent is – is uh, of course putting yourself out there, right? I mean, I, I'm guessing that because you're 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 a prominent guy in your space, people are coming to you all the time. I'm guessing, right? So that makes it great, but at the same time, too, you kind of trying to figure out weeding out through the right people to figure out who do you want on your team. I mean, how do you figure all that out, or do you even need to still advertise for for the right person, uh, or how do you pull them in? Are, are they just coming to you, or are they? Are they just um, are they just showing up at your door? How does that work? I get more messages on LinkedIn from randos trying to spam me than anyone gets on Instagram. Any anyone who says that they get flooded on Instagram with DMs and man, you should see my my. Oh, I, I got a, I got a ton of them, man. I get, I get a five every day at least. <laughs> you probably get more than that. <laughs> I was talking to a girl a couple of days ago who was telling me she gets every time she posts a picture, I don't believe her because she's an attractive girl. She, she says she, get, she gets a thousand DMs. Wow. And, uh, I said, all right, maybe my LinkedIn isn't as bad as your Instagram, but, <laughs> but it's pretty bad. All well, right. there's a lot of thirsty dudes out there. That's yeah. Just <laughs> exactly. So uh, there are a lot of thirsty dudes on LinkedIn too, apparently. True. But uh, but in the real world, outside of social media, I don't know. When we're, when we're trying to hire someone, it really depends on what the role is. So it, it truly comes down to the position. But at the end of the day, it's really about quality, not about quantity. Particularly in a business like ours, because we're running small businesses. When I worked at other companies, I, I worked for companies that employed tens of thousands of people in the past. And the way that you're approaching hiring is very different when you're looking to fill that many spots compared to running smaller operate, smaller, excuse me, entrepreneurial ventures like mine, where again, one bad hire and you're really set back. So it's extremely important that Every single person you bring into your organization is someone who you feel really good about, is someone who you think has the capacity to be a winner and to really help you in whatever that role is. Again, it doesn't matter what position we're looking to fill. We are very thoughtful and very focused on bringing that right individual in. So um, what do we look for? How do we find people? Um, 
you know, we, we talked a little bit about it earlier. Obviously, word of mouth is is helpful. So when we know people who we trust, who we have confidence in, who recommend people, we'll definitely give those people a look. But at the same time, we know what we want. We know what matters to us. We know who fits well into our, our culture. We know what kind of people do well and what kind of roles we have in our organization. For someone to work in our warehouse, we know what is required in terms of work ethic, attitude, um, again, being team oriented, to hire someone to be an engineer. We obviously want that same mindset, but we're also looking for someone who possesses a certain technical skill set that 99.99999% of the people out there don't have. So it really comes down to what we're looking to fill. And, um, you know, it's, I don't, did I answer your question sufficiently? <laughs> and part of it is that, I think that when, when, when you're, when you are putting yourself out there with, whether it is like in your case, you, you're, you're out on social, right? podcast hiring warehouse workers and hiring uh, software engineers but that's what happens right right and, and but the thing is though people know you that's i think that's the great thing about what, what we do with the social media part anyway is that when when you're pulling in all the these people yeah you're gonna get a lot of people that they're just dreamers for instance or there's maybe uh I'm not saying everybody's bad, but I guess what you have to do is is figure out who 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 are the ones that can that can help you and how you can help them right back. And that's probably the the biggest hang up here is it takes time to figure that out, right? Uh, do you do any type of special? Is there any special types of questions? Any special types of ways of figuring out who those people are? Or is it just just time, like interviewing and just going through the basic traditional way of figuring out who you want to bring on your team? Yeah, we've. We don't, we're not an organization that, well, again, a lot of it, a lot of it comes down to what role we're filling. So um, we're not an organization that believes in playing mind games with candidates. We're not an organization that believes in psychological testing or doing things that are going to try to, you know, I don't know if I could, can use this word, but you might have to edit it out afterwards. We're not looking to mind fuck anyone. Right. I mean, we're straightforward. It's like, this is who we are. This is what we're looking to do. We're looking to bring in good, high quality people. We're looking to bring in people who want to work in our environment, who want to excel in our environment and who understand what the role is and who are going to be passionate about the role. And, and then who are obviously going to be able to excel at it. So how do we identify that? It's a combination of us spending time with them, getting to know them, um, and in cases, in, in, posi in positions that are more technical, it's uh, really evaluating their technical skill set. So for software development roles, there is a very, very uh, intense, rigorous, thorough vetting process beyond all this kind of, you know, we're looking for high quality human beings. We are also extremely selective in terms of identifying the absolute best of the best from a technical standpoint. And we do that by deploying um, very rigorous testing. Now, at what point, Let's say, for instance, you bring them on, you spend the time, you, they go through the whole team, you figure out, okay, we're going to hire this person on. But then you realize, you know what? We made a mistake. We probably shouldn't have brought this person on. You know, they're, they're, they're tainting the team. They're, they're talking badly about the, the organization, whatever the case may be. At what point do you, do you cut them off? Do you cut them loose? Ooh, uh, so I wrote an article about this, actually, in Huffington Post. And... Um, the article was originally titled, it, it got changed in the editorial phase, but the article was originally, well, I forgot what, 
how what I forgot what it was ultimately titled, but um, let's put it this way: without without going without getting too granular, without um, getting too detailed, the story was I uh, we hired someone um, who was very very clearly a bad fit for a wide variety of reasons. And again, I don't know how much time we have. We could spend an entire episode just on it in. But um, uh, after one week, um, I, I made the decision to uh, fire this individual. And my team said to me, you can't do that. You can't fire someone after one week. It's, you just can't do that. Like, it's not professional. What, what company fires someone after a week? You've got to give this individual more time. Yes, we agree with everything you're saying. Yes, we know this person is a terrible fit. Yes, all of the reasons why you think this person has to go. We feel exactly the same way, but you can't do it. You're like one week, come on. Um, after the second week, every person on my team was complaining to me and saying, what's taking you so long? Why haven't you fired the person yet? <laughs> like, like, come on, what's what's going on? So, so we we uh, terminated this individual's employment after two weeks. So, so that's that would have been with you though. Would have fired him after the first week, though, for sure, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's if you know they're they're a bad fit, why, why are you prolonging it? You know, you're giving them more opportunity to cause more damage, is what you're doing, right? And then, I think the same thing goes. The same thing goes for vendors as well, right? If a vendor is just a bad fit, why wait it out? Just get rid of them, go to the next one, right? It's uh, there, There's plenty of people out there that can certainly help you build your business. And, you know, if, it, if it's going to, if they're going to cause more damage, keeping them around, you're better off just cutting your losses, get rid of them and, and bring on someone else that can do the job, right? It's simple as that. That's what it sounds like to me. What did Jay Rogers say? Uh, you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them. That one? Yep. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> the fact that I know that is uh, kind of crazy. <laughs> All right, Adam, if you had your one piece of bulletproof advice, what would you tell that person that's listening right now? The great one. I'll share with you something that I share with lots of audiences I speak to. And I strongly believe that most people in life are bad at most things. You've been very kind and generous and making it sound like that I'm great at all these things. But in reality, I'm really bad at most things in life. And I think if you're intellectually honest, you'll probably acknowledge that you're bad at most things in life. And not only you, but you as in all of your listeners, everyone listening to this podcast, I truly believe that most of us are bad at most things in life. I think that we're good at a few things, but we have that one thing each of us has that one thing that makes us special. It's our superpower. It's the thing that makes us unique. It's the thing that makes us different. It's the thing that makes us special. And the more quickly you can figure out what it is about you that makes you different, what it is about you that makes you special, the more quickly you can figure out what your superpower is, the more successful you'll be in business, the more successful you'll be in life, the more successful you'll be as a leader. So I implore anyone and everyone listening to this podcast to get on that journey, to figure out as quickly as you can. And it's a process. It's not going to take 10 minutes. This is something that I spend a lot of time on with the people I work with, with audiences, with teams, but get on that journey. Before you can effectively lead others, you need to be able to lead your own life. And it starts with this. So if there's one thing I can leave your listeners with, it's the importance of understanding what it is about you that makes you special. And start today. Excellent. Love it. Love it. Love it. All right, guys. Well, if you want to reach out to Adam, you can reach him via his website at adammendler.com. Hope you got some insight on how you can apply leadership to help build your team and help them to excel. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next episode. Take care. Hey, Augustino here, and I would love to connect directly with you. 
Text the word BOOKS to 202-410-4202 to receive weekly book recommendations from me.